Good morning everyone and welcome to the LAI Public Library Online Conference 2020. Naturally, we would much prefer to meet you all in person this year, but unfortunately due to the COVID world we're living in, all our talks are virtual. Still, we have a great lineup for you. Our overall theme for the conference is a world of change. Libraries survive and thrive and it runs from November 2020 to April 2021. We have various subheadings for the different sessions. Number one, books, the bare necessities, forget about your worries and your strife, and that quote comes from Baloo in the Jungle Book. Number two, uncertain times, the reading bug is here to stay. Number three, well-being, mindfulness and resilience. Number four, shared reading in digital land. And number five, my life in books. And that is the very popular panel that normally ends our conference each year. So I am now delighted to introduce our first guest to you, and her name is Joanne Sweeney. And Joanne has been working in the field of communications for 20 years. She's a trained journalist, a PR practitioner, and a digital marketing training and consultant. She specializes in digital communication for government agencies, and her latest book, Public Sector Marketing Pro was named in the best PR book of 2020 by the Book Authority. Her talk today is about the role of social media for libraries in a COVID-19 world. Thank you so much for having me. So over the next half an hour or so, I'm going to share with you the role that social media plays for libraries in a COVID-19 world. It's indeed been a strange 2020. I have seven strategies that you can leverage to increase reach, engagement, and ultimately convert social media viewers into library members. I've been working in communications for a whole 20 years, but now specializing in digital communications. Every conversation that we have online leaves a footprint and there is no recession. There's no shortages of members for you online. So let's try and embrace the online world with enthusiasm and with conviction. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, you've got some practical tips to take away and to implement right now. A really good starting point is to understand the extent of social media use in Ireland. On my chart, I have a leaderboard. Some people might find it surprising to see that YouTube actually tops the leaderboard. And in fact, 88% of Irish people are using YouTube. One thing that I wanna tell you about YouTube, it's not only a social network, it's a search engine. Google is the world's largest search engine and YouTube is the world's second largest search engine and it's also owned by Google. So people are now going to YouTube to search topics and to get information. So what video opportunity and what YouTube opportunity is presented to you guys, don't ever forget it. If we then go to Facebook, what's interesting is that Facebook and its other social network and social messaging assets appear at two, at three, at four and at five. So you've got Facebook, you've got Facebook Messenger, you've got WhatsApp and you've got Instagram. Collectively, they are all owned by Facebook. Facebook also have the line to the public. If you wanna reach citizens, you wanna reach the members of the public in your county, in your city, in your town, then you have to be leveraging Facebook's platforms. The other thing to say is that social messaging is growing in popularity right across COVID-19 in 2020, messaging increased by 50% and on WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger in particular. So a question you wanna ask yourself, are we providing customer service and engaging with the public via messaging apps because they have an expectation. Further down, we have Twitter and LinkedIn. Twitter is your corporate PR newsroom and LinkedIn is about building out the professional you online as an individual, but also having company pages. 
If we look at then use, 65% of the population in Ireland right now are using social media. On average, we have seven social networking apps. That includes the messaging apps. 3.2 million people in the country of our 5 million population is active on social. So we really shouldn't be asking ourselves, do we need a social media presence? The answer is yes. And then finally, 38% of people are actually using social media for the purposes of work. So this is relevant to you guys if you're managing social networks accounts for your libraries. Strategy number one of seven. I'm recommending that you host your own Facebook show. I used to be a journalist, so I used to have the opportunity to take a press release, put it on the news bulletins or put it in the bin. Social media has provided us with a remarkable opportunity to be our own publishers of content. Think about your TV show, your radio show, your newspaper, all wrapped into one into Facebook. I've also conducted a study of over 500 government and public sector agencies, including libraries in Ireland in 2020. And what came out of that study was that Facebook performs really well at a local level. People want to know what's happening in their local area. So strategy number one, host a Facebook show. Facebook is Ireland's largest social network after YouTube, but look at the numbers, 3.3 million people you get the public on Facebook. You can have a direct conversation. They can actually have a conversation back with you if you're responsive. So the numbers speak for themselves. I always say to my students and to my clients, don't bring an opinion to a data party because the data doesn't lie. Look at the audience that you have right there, sitting there waiting for you to engage with. You really need to leverage Facebook. So what is a Facebook show? Is it a TV show? What is it? Well, it's a themed series of episodes. For example, you might have a show around top authors from County Galway, for example. This is where I am now. So you then have a themed series of episodes that run maybe one a week for six weeks. And that is an episodic content. They're all broadcast either live on Facebook because we can go live on Facebook at absolutely no cost to us, or we can leverage what we, what we call premieres. So a premiere is a pre-recorded video that is then scheduled in the future, but it broadcasts out to the public as a live stream. For those of you that are nervous about going live, premieres are a perfect opportunity. They're all aimed at one audience. As we know, every good marketer understands their audiences. So if you're having that book show about your authors, maybe they're all part of a particular genre. Maybe it's the top 10 business books that you're going to profile. And so your audience are going to have an interest in business. Maybe they're solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, or they have aspirations to set up their own business. The other thing to say is that a Facebook series and you'll have multiple shows, will happen at the same time, on the same day, over a particular number of weeks. This gives consistency to the audience and also an expectation that you're going to show up on time every time. A Facebook show is absolutely free. All you need is a device, an internet connection, and make sure that your audio is good. People will forgive you for bad video. They'll never forgive you for poor audio. So how does it work? So on screen is an example of a premiere. So when you schedule your Facebook show to go live, Facebook will send a notification to all your fans and followers on your Facebook page. And this is called a notification post. So you can see on screen, I'm due to go live at 2 p.m. using Facebook premiere. And look at the little button that you can tap. If you encourage your audience to tap get reminder, when it comes up to maybe one minute to 2 p.m., they will get a push notification coming on their mobile phone or on their desktop, whatever device that they're on, that, for example, Galway Libraries is about to go live. That is a remarkable marketing opportunity and push notifications. I mean, you don't even have your own app. You're relying on the features and the functionality of Facebook. This is a lovely case study. So it's Dublin City Libraries and it's the Children's Book Festival. 
and you can see what they have. They have a series of videos of authors and staff from the library actually conducting readings and we can sit back and we can listen. There's never been a better time to turn what you're doing in the real world into a product offering in the digital world. You know, many people might still be nervous in 2021 about COVID-19, even if and when the vaccine comes along, more people may choose to remain digitally active as opposed to being out and about. So you need to make sure that you are servicing them. There's a great uh, case study there. I've included the link, go and check it out afterwards. Strategy number two, I'm still sticking with Facebook because Facebook has a dominant public facing audience. And my second tip is to create a video, but keep them under 60 seconds. The real battleground on social media is attention and eyeballs. I said at the start, 3.3 million people using Facebook, that's great. But I know the next question you're gonna ask me is, Joanne, but how do I get their attention? There are so many people on Facebook. How do I get my content to show up on newsfeed and to get that interaction? My second tip is to have video, but under 60 seconds. And there's a reason why I want you to keep it under a minute. Here are some really great stats in relation to video on Facebook. Facebook loves video. The algorithm is going to reward you. It's going to open up and to show your content to more people but we wanna be strategic. I wanna help shortcut you to success. Native video. Native video means a video that's uploaded from your phone or from your computer directly to Facebook actually gets 478% more shares than video from other sources. So don't share a video link from YouTube or from any other channel. The reason that this happens is that Facebook want to keep you on their app they will reward you by keeping the attention of your followers. People gaze at video five times longer than any other type of post. So again, you're getting rewarded. 65% of people want to be captivated within the first three seconds. Your first three seconds and your thumbnail are really important. The thumbnail of a video is actually the still that people see before they press play. And a little tip here that's not on screen, if you include people in your thumbnail, people are more inclined to hit play and to watch for longer. 45% of people will even continue watching for 30 seconds of more if you get them past the three seconds. So you're seeing now already that the duration of your video is really, really important because the metric that you want to measure here is called retention rate. How much of our video is being watched by the public? There's absolutely no point in spending time on video, investing on video, publishing video, and then people not watching your video. So these tactics are really important. The Facebook video average benchmark is 10 seconds. And so you really want to try and get people in for 10 seconds. So think about your content. And then Facebook videos with numbers in their titles get way more views and a higher retention rate. So for example, the top three business books that you wanna buy now or that you wanna read now, okay? Because it's, it's telling the public that you've done the research, you've picked the best, um, and of course, for that reason, people will listen to you. So the top takeaway from strategy number two if a viewer watches a video for at least three seconds, it counts as a view. YouTube considers a view 30 seconds. That's 10 times greater. So it is more difficult to get YouTube views. In such a scenario, if viewers are watching 10 or more seconds of your videos, it means they're consuming your content and the result is positive sentiment. Positive sentiment towards your brand, towards the content itself and towards your staff. If you can get this to average at 15 seconds, it means the engagement levels of your Facebook videos are impressive. And that is 25% of 60 seconds. You really wanna get people to tune in for 15 seconds. In fact, some people are actually creating 15 second videos 
to get a hundred percent retention rate. But for you, if you want to, if you've got something more to say, then sixty seconds is is probably a good rule of thumb. This is a case study from the New South Wales State Library, and what I'm sharing with you here is the amount of traction, positive sentiment, and video views that they are getting from investing in video. So have a watch. So this is the Facebook page of the State Library of New South Wales. And what I've recognized as best practice and as successful on Facebook for this library is the fact that they really engage in video marketing. What's also interesting is that they keep their videos quite short to under 60 seconds in the main, but often shorter. The reason that they would adopt this strategy is because what you're looking for here is a high view through rate. So actually getting people to watch as much of your video as possible, because remember, Facebook will deem a video view three seconds but what can people actually see in three seconds and perhaps they're only scrolling by so so let's have a look at one of their videos look at this video almost thirty thousand views and it's actually just a carousel of photos and it's on the world press photo exhibition 2020. So the takeaway from this video for Facebook and under one minute. For strategy number three, we're jumping across to another Facebook asset and we're going to Instagram. I'm encouraging you to use Instagram Live to build a tribe. So according to Instagram and their stats for 2020, at least 80% of Instagram users rely on Instagram to decide whether to buy a product or service. This is a very engaged audience. It's no surprise that you can also shop on Instagram. What are you selling? You're selling membership. You want more members to engage with your services and with your products. So it really is a natural home for libraries. Followers who haven't turned off notifications for live video will get notifications to say that you are live when they're on the platform. And in fact, people are spending more time on Instagram as a channel than any other one. And did you know 80% of people would rather watch a live stream than read an article or read a blog? And even in my own experience, going live is nerve wracking. But you know what? The natural stream of consciousness of having a conversation with the public through a screen helps you build the know, like, and trust factors, the three factors and the three ingredients that make for great digital communication success. You don't always have to go live and put a staff member in, in front of screen. How about you have a takeover? Invite authors, crowdsource, ask your followers, what authors would you like to come and do a reading live on Instagram? Choose different genres. Be creative, be innovative. The next thing that you want to think about is choosing a style for your Instagram lives. How is it going to work for our library? How will it suit our tone of voice and our own personalities? So here are some examples. Go live on your own with news and updates. Always choose one topic. When we go live, we always are talking about one topic. Or maybe you have a, a three part roundup from the week of what happened in your library. Another idea would be give over your Instagram account to an author who might do a reading. You might also do a two person uh, live broadcast and you can do that on Instagram because the screen will split. So the person hosting will sit on top and the guest will sit underneath. Interviews are very interactive. And then maybe have a series. So perhaps a, a Christmas series, Christmas stories at bedtime, 7 p.m. every evening from the 10th to the 24th of December. 
you could do Easter, you could do holidays. Again, think about the seasons, think about what's happening in people's lives. The other great opportunity from conducting a live stream is that it has huge repurposability factor. By that I mean you say it once, but you share it often. When you finish an Instagram live, you can then add it directly to your IGTV, Instagram TV. This means that that video is available forever. It won't disappear after the broadcast ends. You can also then share it from IGTV onto your stories. So this gives more opportunity for people to see it. You can download it and you can upload it to your YouTube channel. And then from there, you can embed it on your website. And the reason that you're repurposing is that you want multiple digital touch points to hit people right across the social web. And of course, you can clip a little bit off the video and then you can tweet it. And of course, you could put a little bit up as a Facebook post as well. Strategy number four, and hey, I'm assuming that you guys are really good at this, and that is social storytelling. Everybody loves a story, and Irish people are great at yarns and tales. I love this. Did you know that our brains are wired to remember stories more than facts and figures alone? You think about the last story that somebody's ever told you, and then you recounted it to somebody else. There's some great memory retention for a story. So start think about the content that you create for social in the form of storytelling. Use my social media funnel when you're creating content for social if you want to maximize the reach and the engagement. So a funnel really is awareness. So at the top, do people know what I do, what we're all about? Engagement. They know us, now they like us, and they're interested in the content. And then the conversion. Maybe they convert from a social media fan into a member of your library. After that, we have raving fans. They amplify what we're doing. They share our content on social. They tag their friends and their family and recommend us. They become advocates and they build up loyalty. So here's how it works in practice. I love Christmas, so I decided to create a Christmas theme. These are just examples that I created on my own Facebook page, but of course I did not publish them uh, for illustrative purposes only. So remember the top of the funnel, we had awareness and we're beginning to tell a story. What does the story have? A story has a beginning, it has a middle, and a story has an end. So that's what we're doing in this example. The beginning is awareness, the middle is engagement, and the end is conversion. So watch. So the awareness piece introduces your content, your story, or your topic. In this first example, I'm introducing my Christmas storytelling at bedtime event. So I'm introducing it in this Facebook post. Okay, so you can see the post there, and I'm using my hashtag, I'm using emojis, I'm asking people to set a reminder. So I'm introducing the fact that we have this new live show coming up on our Facebook page. Then I'm moving on to engagement and I'm presuming that my followers have seen this content in their newsfeed. So next I wanna develop the story. So engagement promotes engagement. You want them to respond, reactions on the post, tagging people, sharing, adding comments. So. What I'm doing here in this example is I'm crowdsourcing ideas. I'm bringing the public into the conversation. I'm not just broadcasting and telling people what I'm doing. I want them to get involved. And I've said, what's your favorite Christmas story? Share it below and we might choose to read it. That's really important. With social storytelling, it's not about you, it's about the public. Of course, you're telling the story, but you need to make it about them. Finally, the end of the story, this is the conversion piece. And a conversion means the public or your fans acting on what we call a CTA, a call to action. CTAs work really well on social media because the public like to be told what to do, what action to take. So in this example, we're saying win library membership 
for your family for 2021. Tag a family member that you believe deserves this prize and the winner will be announced on our final Facebook Live story at bedtime on Christmas Eve at 7 p.m. So you see what I did? I had awareness, I had engagement, and I had conversion. If you use the strategic approach to social storytelling, you're gonna get better results. And this is why we never show up on social aimlessly and have this idea in our head that we need to post three times a week. What are we going to say? We're gonna be very considered and discerning in our approach. Strategy number five, hashtags. What's a hashtag? A hashtag is the pound symbol on your phone, okay? They were born on Twitter 12 years ago, but now they have an important role to play on every single social network. A hashtag allows you to join a conversation, to start a conversation, or to understand what's being said about a particular person, organization, or indeed a topic. You might have heard people talking about trending hashtags on Twitter. What that simply means is that means that's the most discussed topic right now on Twitter in Ireland. That can be a good thing, could also be a bad thing. I always recommend that when you're in campaign mode that you have your own hashtags. You should also use popular hashtags to reach more people that are interested in that theme. There's also science-based evidence that tells us how many hashtags we should use in our social posts. On Facebook, the optimum number is one. On Twitter, the optimum number is two. On Instagram, you can add up to 30, but the optimum number is 13. On LinkedIn, it's five. On TikTok, it's 10. And on YouTube, it's three. There are five types of hashtags that you should start thinking about and ask yourself, are we using them or will we introduce them? So the first one is a campaign hashtag. So for example, in my previous example, my Christmas bedtime stories, I would maybe use Christmas stories live. You also have an event hashtag. So for example, for this event, it might be live ASS Conf 20. So if people want to get involved in the conversation on Twitter or in any other social network, they just put in that hashtag and then they can join it. A branded hashtag relates to your organization. So for example, Galway Library Live. A trending hashtag might be COVID-19, Christmas 2020, or anything that's big on the news. And then finally, make sure that you're using a topical hashtag and that this will relate to your work or indeed the type of organization you are. So in this case, library or plural libraries. Here are two really useful tools and there are free versions of these that you can use to research hashtags and to find out how popular they are. So we have WriteTag and also hashtagify.me. Finally, look at the power of a hashtag. This is an event that I held in recent times and my hashtag was almost trending in Ireland. I think we had over, what, almost 200 tweets. But have a look, positive sentiment of 89%. The economic value of that hashtag for a two hour event was 5,000 euro if I was to pay for the equivalent of that coverage. The impacts reached almost 2.5 million. So the viral and the exponential impact of hashtags cannot be understated. I use Tweetbinder to measure the reach of my hashtags. Strategy number six, Twitter as your digital PR newsroom. It's very, very important that you think about Twitter as corporate communications. It's not really the public facing social channel. Yes, you do have members of the public there, but they're there because they love sport, news, events, they're subject matter experts, or they have a particular interest in particular topics. So here are the top Twitter tactics that you can deploy on this social network. It's hugely powerful. Remember I said hashtags were born there, don't forget them. But you can create lists. Lists is a feature that live on Twitter that don't exist anywhere else. And what a list allows you to do 
It allows you to put accounts of people or organizations into a category. And when you tap on your lists on Twitter, your whole news feed changes into only the tweets from those people. So if you think about who are the people you're trying to influence, you've got reading enthusiasts, you've got library members, you've got library community, government bodies, politicians, the media, local stakeholders, authors, subject matter experts. These are the type of audiences that you will try to reach on Twitter with your corporate comms. I mentioned lists. It is my number one Twitter feature and probably one of the top three features of all social networks. It allows me to engage in what I call social listening. So what are my stakeholders and my audiences tweeting about? What do they care about? Putting them into lists is really valuable. Threads are a series of linked tweets. As you probably know, we have 280 characters to tweet. However, if you've got something more to say, you can have a linked series of tweets, which are called threads. They also get more engagement. Video also lives on Twitter, as do live streams. For your press conferences, official announcements, anytime you're engaging in PR, I would have a soundbite from a spokesperson on video to release on Twitter. How often should I tweet? There are 8,000 tweets sent a second. It's a difficult place to get noticed, but if you build a relevant following, you'll get good engagement. Rule of thumb, starting off, you need to tweet twice a day because the lifespan of a tweet is very, very short. It's less than five minutes. Don't forget to engage with others. It's not about you. This goes for all the social networks. Make sure that you are following others, promoting others, creating content from other library accounts across the country and sharing them. Every day you'll have trends on Twitter. What are the trending topics for today? Is it relevant? Can I stand into that conversation? One thing I always recommend, never hijack a trending conversation if you don't have anything to add. The Booker Prize, Book Awards, International Book Day. These are all trends that will trend on Twitter that you have a right to speak. Additionally, you can add polls. Polls are a great way to get engagement, to have a conversation. And then, of course, don't forget photos or GIFs or infographics. Adding images to a tweet will increase engagement. And then finally, stories were introduced to Twitter in late 2020 and they're called fleets. Yeah, it rhymes with tweets and they're called fleets. They flutter away after 24 hours and it's self-deleting content. So modeled on stories from Snapchat, Instagram and Facebook. Early adopters who send fleets will see themselves getting more engagement. Finally, from a Twitter perspective, don't forget to have a look at your analytics. Analytics.twitter.com will give you a 28 day look back and a seven day look back of the impact of your tweets. I started my career in local radio where I actually spoke to 68,000 people a day. I get to speak to more people on Twitter. It's an amazing platform, so use it. So strategy number seven, people not PR. It's called social media. We're meant to be social, we're meant to be human. I really want you to start thinking about who are the people in your organization and in your broader network, stakeholders, authors, children who love to read books, schools, who you can put front of screen and put front of your messaging. People will engage with people and human faces that appear in posts, human stories that are shared get much more engagement. Here are a number of ideas that you can deploy. We want to broaden our storytelling. We want to broaden our appeal. So make sure that you're putting the person at the center of the story and not always the press release. Bonus strategy, why not have a bonus? I know the, the title was seven strategies, but I'm feeling generous and I want to give you a final one. And this really is about measuring success. If I deploy and implement Joanne's seven strategies, how will I know if they actually work? Well, then that's where you get into measurement. So don't forget to measure success. So what does success look like on social media? Well, you've got to understand how many people does your content reach? So those numbers are called reach and impressions. The next metric that matters is engagement. This is a percentage number. What percentage of people who actually follow us are engaging with their content? For me, that is the real measure of success. 
If you want to know what engagement rates you should be aiming for, I did the study. So on Facebook, 0.3%, on Twitter, 0.2%, and then on Instagram, 0.6%. And that's based on an average of over 500 organizations in Ireland. Then if you're producing video, clearly you want to look at video view. So how many people are watching our video? But remember that video retention rate, what percentage of the video did they watch? Social media is a large contributor to website traffic. So don't forget to have a look at your Google Analytics and then have a look at referral traffic and then have a look at social media. Because if people are coming from social media to your website, they have a huge intention to engage with your services. The hashtag I mentioned, it can have an amazing impact. Then also look at the content. So look at every month the most engaging content and then the least engaging content and never stop learning from your data because data matters. And remember what I said, don't bring an opinion to a data party because the facts are in the data. There you go. Eight ways to leverage social media for success in the library network. I hope you find them valuable. If you have any questions for me in terms of, you know, what has been the impact for you, you want to give me feedback, then make sure that you get in touch with me. Of course, I'm available on all the social networks. And I want to wish you continued success in your social media journey. And remember, social media is a fundamental way in which we communicate. And it's not just for young people and it's not just for influencers. Thank you.